You want to start, or? <laughs> All right. Uh, since we only have um, half an hour, I, we thought we were going to keep it very brief in terms of intro and go straight to questions and answers. Um, and at least speaking for myself, I can say uh, questions and answers shouldn't be questions there and answers here. I also have a bunch of questions, as you'll find out in a second. So let's, let's talk quickly and, uh, and try to get as much exchange possible, which could be very fruitful. My name is Lukas Streif. I'm from the German Foreign Office, currently posted in headquarters here in Berlin. Um, so not a diplomat at the moment working abroad, but working in the headquarters of foreign policy here in Germany. And um, of course, one of the issues that we are working on is migration. Um, the interface between data and foreign affairs is, of course, important. But actually, when I was thinking, which jobs have the least to do with data that is measurable and quantifiable? It was pretty hard to come up with a job that has less to do with data than, than, uh, than diplomacy. I mean, everything in diplomacy is qualitative. Everything in diplomacy is about uh, finding nuanced solutions to complex issues. And numbers very rarely um, matter in them. We have an operational side, of course, giving out visas and handling operational requests for the German citizens abroad. But everything in terms of diplomatic hardcore work is, is very hard to measure. And uh, so the interface is quite limited. And you know, from my previous work, where I was in consulting and mainly in the private sector, where every number was double-checked 15 times, it is a massive cultural change. Um, but in the Foreign Office, there is a lot of awakening going on. Data and quantitative analysis is becoming much more important, is getting attention of the, of the minister and the higher-ups in the ministry. And there is a real kind of re-education um, of, of the senior leadership going on. Um, there is an annual conference of where all the ambassadors posted around the world come together to Berlin to meet with the minister and the leadership of the ministry. And this year, one of the workshops was on big data and what big data uh, could mean and should mean for the German Foreign Office. So the, 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 the heads are starting to shift, and there's a lot of thinking going on. And today, we can zoom in on one of the aspects where data, we believe, has a lot to show us and to improve the policy making that we make. Right. So my name is Jasper Tjaden. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, I work for the International Organization of Migration. It's the UN Migration Agency. Not to be confused with UNHCR. They deal with all the refugees, and we do with everybody else uh, who's a migrant. Um, IOM opened a center here in Berlin last year, and it's called the Global Migration Data Analysis Center, and they were really answering calls for a better understanding of migration data, um, understanding what's going on, understanding what we don't know, and um, helping ministries, helping civil society and the media to, to uh, get a picture of what's, of what's going on based on solid, hopefully reliable uh, data analysis. Um, on the way here, I was really thinking, OK, what, uh, what is going to interest you in, in, in my job as d data people and data scientists? So I just want to throw three uh, challenges into the room that we have um, as an office. And maybe these are the challenges where uh, you're interested in uh, helping out, potentially. So first issue in migration and, and data is that we don't really have good data. I mean, if you look at Europe and, and the US and the developed world, OK, there's some, there's some stuff out there. But then if you go to Africa, if you go to Asia, uh, if you go to the sort of developing and, um, and emerging economies, then the picture looks very bleak if you look closely. So, so here, uh, there's, there might be potential for looking at new innovative data sources like uh, big data, you know, looking at Twitter, Facebook, Google searches, looking at mobile phone data, um, looking at satellite pictures. These are all attempts that are going on, but they're very siloed in the research field. And we're trying to slowly bring them into the policy world. The second problem is that the data, if it is available, is very uh, scattered. You know, it's government offices uploading a PDF and saying, yeah, you report on migration, and nobody ever finds it, and there's no raw data online. So uh, I think a field that is interesting for data people is you know, in the, also in the area of web scraping, crawling, and so forth, bringing this, pulling this data from very scattered sources together and making it uh, accessible for a wider public and, um, and the media. The last point, then, is that the data surrounding migration is very political and very complex. So you have to really be careful what you communicate and what you share and how you describe it and analyze it. So there's a great point to be made around presentation of the data. 
And their visualizations are really useful, infographics, um, interactive dashboards, and so forth. This is where uh, you know, you, the expertise is here and not so much uh, here. Um, so yeah, I just want to leave you with these three points, you know, data collection, the scatteredness of data, and then how we present that data. These are three really big challenges that we face in, in the migration world and where we're trying to, trying to appeal to uh, the tech world and using their tools to, uh, to inform policy. So let's open up for Q&A. Um, yeah, I was, I was told we'd just give a short intro, and then uh, uh, I was told this is a very inquisitive, active crowd. <laughs> Who's got a question for us already or a comment you'd like to make? Yeah. Uh, the difference, the question was, what's the difference between a refugee and a migrant? Um, not a data question, but a international law question. Um, or did you want to expand on your question? It's I guess. Why do you make a difference between migrant and refugee? Why do we make the difference between migrants and refugees? Because refugees uh, deserve um, their even more protection than migrants do, and international law has, over the last centuries, try to uh, identify the cases where humans are dislocated so uh, in, in such a vulnerable state that they deserve the highest level of protection um, that the international community has to give them. And for that group, which is very clearly defined in the, in the Geneva Convention on, uh, on Refugees, um, that group called Refugees then has the highest level of protection. Um, that, of course, doesn't mean that, the, that migrants don't have protection. That's why organizations such as IOM exist, uh, to, to help them, um, whoever is on the move, which is never an easy thing to do. Um, but the, as you can see here already in German uh, internal discussions, and not just in Germany, um, the, the willingness to help people uh, decreases um, when you go from a war-displaced refugee to someone who would, uh, seeks a better life for economic reasons purely. And in order to protect the, the, the protection that you have to give to the most vulnerable, it is important to make that distinction. There's one there, there's one there. And... What use cases do you currently see in, in both of your organizations that are currently utilizing data that's available now, and which ones do you see closest on the roadmap? And also, how is this um, new ability to use data changing the way diplomacy is actually done? Or at least how you guys see this, how you guys, how your teams are, are working together? Mm -hmm. Maybe I can respond on the fir first part of the question, so what are, what are ongoing um, analysis that we do. Um, it used to be, in the migration world, only censuses that are available, you know, that are run every couple of years in, in most countries, and they're you know, just vast, basically, uh, population, population surveys. And the second one is more targeted, smaller surveys that we work with. Uh, and then thirdly, there is a bulk of administrative data that is out there, so that governments collect while, uh, during their operations. I mean, most of the, for example, asylum data that we have in Germany is all based on administrative data of uh, public authorities collecting it. And, um, and there are lots of issues around that, you know, issues of accessibility and, 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 and privacy issues. Um, with the censuses, there's the issue that it's, you know, it's not very timely. In many countries, we don't have censuses in the last 10 years, uh, so that's a problem. But the, the, the kinds of analysis that we do is, yeah, usually survey data analysis. Um, and, uh, and now we're looking, we're looking into new sorts of data sources, like big data. I mean, there's interesting projects going on, as I mentioned, um, se several papers out on looking at how Google searches correlate with actual migration flows or how um, geocoded Twitter posts reflect movement uh, of people. Um, analyzing satellite pictures to, to track human mobility. Um, especially, one great example is the disaster response in Haiti, where um, researchers used mobile phone data to track how the displacement uh, was going on in real time, and then to target their uh, humanitarian response so these are really, uh, really exciting um, new ways to analyze the data. And um, before I give over to, to Lucas, um, 
because you ask about how this, how this analysis has changed the way the, the field works. I believe everybody is, there's great demand for data. Everybody wants better data and more accurate data and more sort of sexy and good looking data. But um, everybody is very cautious about the political instrumentalization of those, of those data, which is, uh, which is why our, f our field is very interesting to work in, but also very, very highly political. And we can't just publish papers, uh, even if we had the data. We have to consult with uh, a lot of other institutions, with national governments, um, and so forth. So I would say uh, it is a great, powerful tool, but it's because of it is so powerful, uh, you know, it's very politically sensitive to use it. The use cases in the German Foreign Office, um, and I think this applies to all, all kinds of um, international affairs agencies or diplomatic services, I'd say there's three, three main ones. The first one is crisis early detection, early warning. Um, this is the job of diplomatic posts. That's why we have around 200 of them all over the world, to find out what's happening on the ground and to, to give early warning so that we can have forward-looking policymaking. Um, but of course, that's been highly qualitative and experience-based, expert-based on the ground, which is great and which has value going forward. Um, the abilities, of course, for crunching numbers on a grand scale in quantitative means to detect indicators that suggest that crisis might be impending is, is fast developing. And so that is one area where we're catching up and where the German Foreign Office decided last year to build a new unit. In, in, we have a new big department uh, like the Europe Department or the, you know, the International Security Department for crisis early warning and crisis management and post-crisis um, uh, construction. And one of the new divisions in there is, is staffed just to build a tool, a crisis early warning tool, um, working with proprietary data sets and proprietary tools um, to give the German Foreign Office the ability to do quantitative early crisis warning as well as the qualitative kind of old school reporting that we do with our wires um, that come in every day from around the world. First use case, crisis early warning system. That's kind of as close as we get to big data uh, in the German Foreign Office at the moment. Second use case um, is migration, for example. So it's a specific policy field where there is a lot of interest, a lot of political uh, work to be done at the moment, and where we have to collate data and, and inform policy making that we do. In this case, you have to imagine it like this. There's a bunch of people who are basically generalists. Diplomats, in general, are generalists. Um, so they're not data, data specialists. They're not migration specialists. And they get together and um, have to very quickly, like last year when the crisis uh, in terms of refugees and migration um, in Europe, in the Mediterranean, on the Balkans, started to be really hot, have to very quickly uh, do, deliver great work that is hopefully uh, reality-based and fact-based. And in this case, it basically looks like this. You have IOM giving data sets and reports, like you mentioned. UNHCR data is coming in. EU data is coming in, et cetera. Um, the main data for migration within Germany is from the Ministry of the Interior and the agencies that work for it, so that's not, not us. Um, but we have a staff in the German Foreign Office that coordinates all kinds of things to do with refugees and migration, and they literally collate report numbers and put them into Excel. I mean, it's totally rudimentary at this point. Uh, and so developing from that kind of PDF collage into Excel and then reporting it in live meetings and stuff and putting it into the briefing documents for conversations between leaders, that kind of system, developing that quickly and while the bus is running, uh, into a more dashboard-oriented, user-friendly, analytically more powerful system. That is the second use case. And the third, and it's also related to migration, is in terms of communication. Because basically, if you think about it, diplomacy is all communication, whether it be one-to-one -one talking to some kind of dictator who's ruining his country and you're trying to find a solution that saves lives, or whether it's putting out a press release about a conference that was all nice and dandy. It's all communication that we do. and so. One of the big use cases there is how can we analyze um, communication data, social media monitoring, but not just social media, just all kinds of online communication data that is freely accessible, and, and how can we make that or how can we use that to better inform how we communicate? And so staying with migration, because that's the topic that we were asked to, to speak about here, a huge problem, and it ties back to your question about refugees and migration and what the difference is, a huge challenge that we're facing is that um, my, a lot of migration, the surveys of IOM and other colleagues show, 
happens on very faulty information. People make hugely costly and dangerous routes and even lose their lives on assumptions that are completely wrong and that have been fed to them by people who have a vested interest in then making the journey, people smugglers. They tell them all kinds of things. It takes a week to cross the Sahara and it only costs 500 euros or it only costs 300 euros to make it from Afghanistan all the way uh, to Germany. Or, you know, you have Facebook groups where there's literally 5 million followers where smugglers just advertise um, their trips from Libya uh, to Italy as if it was a ferry company with, you know, departure time, price, a picture of the ship, which of course looks new and perfectly safe. Then the migrants arrive there and ooh, it's just a rubber dinghy and they're all ferried onto a tiny rubber dinghy, 150 people. You know, that's the kind of situation where there's informational spaces that are massively large and that inform very dangerous and costly decisions for these people. And so far, we are barely active in these spaces and aren't, aren't really correcting misconceptions. So that, you know, social media monitoring and informing communication is the third main use case that I'd see. Uh, I'd like you to imagine there is someone coming to the European border and uh, it's super hard to like, decide if you want to let him in or not, right? So imagine you have all the big data. You have um, Twitter accounts and you have um, satellite videos and maybe he has even to answer 20 questions and you take a picture of his face and then you have a machine learning algorithm. Anyone, you can pick everyone, your favorite one, which gives you just a score how likely it is that this person would fit for whatever that means. Is this something, is this a cool and sexy tool or is this a nightmare? Um, that's, that's more of a, let's say, philosophical and a, a normative question, uh, which is tricky to answer, but um, which I certainly can answer on, on sort of uh, behalf of my uh, institution. But um, it's a good question that you bring up, because even if we had all the information, you know, what is, what is the right decision to take? In my view, uh, it's, it's the task of the society to decide uh, what rules they want to have and, and what governs. Um, uh, you know, in a democratic society, you uh, vote on, 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 on the rules and regulations that you put in place. And um, uh, in the end, we vote for, uh, we elect politicians that then uh, make those judgment calls. So I don't think it should be a data automatism that uh, makes, makes those kind of uh, decisions. It should be in the hands of uh, of the society and the politicians that were elected. Yeah, and I'd, I'd build on that by saying that that kind of a tool, even if it were incredibly powerful and all correct, wouldn't make a single difference at all. Not a single case would get decided differently. Because, uh, you know, the, the, what your question kind of pa paints a picture of is that there's people who make kind of judgment calls on who to let into Europe or not. And that's not the case. It's, this is a, a very highly regulated space where the current laws are what decide uh, who gets let in and who not. And that means that at airports uh, flying into the EU, you have to have a visa or you are from a visa-free country. And if you don't have it, you will not get on board or you will be turned around in Frankfurt Airport, etc. If you arrive in, in unregulated means, such as in a rubber, rubber dinghy from Libya to Italy, you will be saved by the Coast Guard. Hopefully they find you in time. Um, which happens every day, um, and then you will be brought to Italy and um, you will be checked according to the documents that you have still, possibly, and otherwise other, other ways of interviewing, etc. Um, and it, it is purely the laws that regulate whether you will be granted asylum and can stay or whether that is not the case, and then we are talking about returns. Uh, and so even if we had amazing prediction tools that would say this person has a 99.9 .9 percentile uh, probability of finding a job within two weeks, it doesn't change a thing. It's about legal definitions of who has uh, residency rights and who doesn't. I see one here. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Perfect data on migration ultimately would have to come down to identity, wouldn't it? Uh, determining that somebody is indeed who they say they are and as they move around, uh, that's the same person. And that could really get into some privacy issues if you think about some of the biometric um, you know, scenarios and fantasies. So um, what's the, um, 
sort of what, what, what measures are in place? What's the thinking about that? And are there protections in place to uh, prevent you know, real incursions into privacy around this topic? Um, it's not my, uh, it's not the area where we work uh, directly, but um, one, one detail on that, the EU is trying to pass the a smart borders package, which kind of includes some of these measures um, for years and years. And it was very tricky, and the main, uh, the main issue of um, political dissent was, of course, privacy issues and protection of uh, data protection issues. I mean, yeah, that's all I can really, really say about that. Do you have anything? anything uh, also, not the level that I work in every day. I, I don't work on uh, on the systems in which we keep um, the asylum applications or um, uh, visa applications. And again, the German Foreign Office just does the visa application. When you're applying for a visa abroad, that is our thing. The internal um, minist the Ministry of the Interior and their agencies they do the asylum checks for the BAMF, the Bundesagentur für Flucht und Migration they do the, the checks for asylum seekers. But of course these are, especially in Germany, where data protection is incredibly sensitive and very seriously taken, um, this, these are systems are very isolated and uh, highly protected. And the problem is that you know, there, is, there is a certain trade-off between efficiency, data sharing, especially within 28, soon 27 member states in the European Union who, who would hopefully share um, information. Doing that while adhering to our very strict data protection um, standards is, is hard. And there is a trade-off, no doubt about it. In Germany, compared with the other countries, probably it's safe to say that we are erring on the data safety side. Yeah, just to add to that, it's not so much on the, on the border question, but certainly every inf all the information that we collect worldwide, um, and there's a lot, of, a lot of data that's being gathered. Uh, it's all anonymized, and there, you know, we, we're not talking about biometric identification and things like that. So in, yeah. in sort of the IOM world, it's still all aggregated, anonymized uh, data. Yeah. yeah, same here. And so that also means that you know, the, if the BAMF, our colleagues from the interior agencies who are doing the applications uh, of migrants and refugees arriving, they have to basically start from scratch and build up the data set um, from what the people have with them or what can be ascertained. There isn't a you know massive dossier on migrants that are crossing European borders that is traveling with them. That's not the case. Um, yeah. And maybe just one side note while we pass the mic on um, on just showing you how data protection uh, or personal privacy protection influences our work. It goes so far that basically uh, some data um, protection. Um, the responsibility, you know, figures of data protection responsibility from some representatives for data protection in the German government are so opposed to governments um, conversing in social media that they'd love to forbid us from doing it entirely. I mean, it, it basically starts at that very general question whether a government can even uh, communicate on social media. It's, it's a, in Germany, a highly sensitive topic. And so we're quite far away from an Orwellian world where the government knows everything about everyone in, in my asylum applications. I think there was one there and then over there. Yeah. Hi, my question is uh, coming back to the challenge that you mentioned about data collection. And uh, yeah, so coming from the uh, technology background, uh, apart from the political, um, oh what kind of technology challenges that you face? So there is a general myth or perception, yeah, that administrative offices are too slow, or, or there is a skill set gap, or people are always sticking to the legacy world, not coming really into the uh, new technologies or geek world, so-called, yeah. Is this just a myth, or do you really uh, have uh, the, the new technologies in, in place to, uh, to, to, to have all the data collection in, uh, that you need? to go to the future? Hmm. I mean, um, so I work for the, for the UN organization, so we, we to always have a sort of global perspective, obviously. And um, the situation is very, very different if you go into different regions. So in the EU and well, all OECD countries, it's a completely different picture. But we are really interested in um, building capacity you know, in African countries and Asian countries in, uh, in other regions of the world because a lot, of the, a lot of the movement that we see is happening south to south, which is actually larger movements than south to north, but also south to north. So 
And actually, in order to get some accurate picture of what's going on in terms of, of human mobility and movement, you need data from, um, from developing in, uh, countries. But if you look there, it's, um, it's a capacity problem. We, we talk with statistical offices on a regular basis, and in some countries, uh, yeah, there's an issue of capacity, simply not the infrastructure in place, also not the, the, yeah, the skills gap that, that you mentioned. And of, certainly an issue of resources in most countries to, um, to collect the data that would be needed to, um, to inform policy, right? And then, um, so I would say that's, that's the first challenge, but then if you go into to the more developed world, then another issue is um, uh, privacy. So a lot of data that would be interesting to analyze from a researcher's perspective, you simply don't have access to because there are diary, uh, data privacy and data protection issues, which are, um, which makes sense in most cases. In other cases, you would say, okay, uh, um, there, there's a lot of potential of looking at metadata, and, um, but that is often not available. Um, so yeah, leave it at that. So the one is the capacity issue, and the other one is the, the, the access issue to data that is out there and that could be, could be analyzed. Yeah. Um, I just add one thing, which is you asked about um, whether there is kind of connection enough between the people that are doing the daily job and are still using their means that they used 10 years ago and the fastly developing uh, analytical data side. And uh, quick, quick answer is no, there isn't. Um, in, the, in my institution, I can just say, we don't have kind of data scientists in residence or something. You know? We don't. And uh, the average interaction and interface between a normal diplomat and data scientists is quite limited. And so probably we are using massive amounts of outdated uh, systems we're relying on MS Office Suite far too much. Um, and so the, the quick answer, or more than an answer, it's really a hope on my side at least, you know, that we have more interaction like this, um, that we have more connection between the foreign, sector, uh, the foreign office or the public sector in general, international organizations such as IOM and you guys, because it really is a massively underutilized interface. And yes, there's probably speakers in this conference who are working for institutions that can pay better and, and can offer quicker careers. But I venture to say that there's rarely an organization that can offer as much job satisfaction because you know that every day you're working on really important stuff for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. Uh, and so if there is people out there uh, in, in this crowd or your networks who are passionate about this stuff and who are passionate to bring innovation into the public sector and to work on these issues from a data side, we can't offer much more than an internship, and it's paid crap. But if it is still interesting to you, do let me know. Uh, <laughs> uh, at Lucas Strife on Twitter, if you send me a message or something, let us know. We are very, very open to it. Our means are limited, but we'd love to have more interaction on this, in this realm. Yeah. Last minute. This clock says to us. It's actually running. Oh, I just see that it's running down. <laughs> it is, and it's fast. Fast. So maybe last question. We have one here. One here. I don't know. Oh yeah, I think you will be first. Um, my question is not strictly related with data, but this still has uh, a lot to do with uh, information and knowledge predictions. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that Chancellor Kohl has said that uh, uh, Germany is not a country of migration of immigrants, kind of Einwanderungsland. Um, would you agree? And uh, has something changed in, in the last 25 years? And what is your opinion? Is something going to change in the next 25 years? Right. Are there some predictions at the uh, Foreign Office about that? That's a, that's a tall order for the remaining 10 seconds. <laughs> but um, um, I'll give it a really quick shot. I mean. Today, it's a completely different picture, and we know where near. I mean, um, the, the, the whole debate has changed, the policies have changed drastically, and, and um, I think from the policies and also from the debate, Germany has uh, evolved into a country of immigration. I mean, it was before, but it was sort of the reluctant country of immigration. But now, uh, through all the mainstream parties, I think um, this, is, this is very, very recognized. And uh, if you compare German policies to other European countries, we don't have to hide in terms of uh, what we uh, provide in uh, integration assistance and, and, yeah, and, and other policies. So I think, um, it, yeah, it's not true that we're not a country of immigration anymore. 
and and uh, yeah, this it's it's a real. It's good that you that you remind us of that because it seems so far away in the the past in this statement. Yeah. All true, uh, and I venture to say that a chancellor today wouldn't say the same thing anymore. And also, in fact, they don't. They they do very clearly talk about it, um, and answering it with data. I mean. It's a no-brainer. Of course we are a country of immigration, of course. And actually, I venture to say there's hardly any country around the world that isn't a country of immigration. Immigration has been, migration has been with humanity ever since we can walk on two legs and maybe even before. All right.